gratitudes. Um, last week I did blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which I really focused on. To hunger and thirst for righteousness in the age that we live in, it means to hunger and thirst for Jesus. We have no righteousness that is our own. All of our righteousness is Jesus. So if we're hungering for righteousness, we're hungering for Jesus. Um, so that's a little just um, synopsis of what was last week. But unfortunately, what happened is, is I did not look at the Beatitudes last week, and so I went out of order. <laughs> I was like, wow. Um, okay, so we are back to um, what was right above the one we did last week, which is um, verse 5. So we're at 5-5, five, five, Matthew 5-5, five, five, which is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I feel like this is one of the most famous... Um, it's throughout, I mean, I think it's even on some of our government buildings. It's a very well-known beatitude. A very um, interesting one because when, the lens I like to have people look through when we're talking about the beatitudes is likeness. Because what Jesus is inviting us into when he gives these, I'm going to move, I'm going to change mics. What Jesus is inviting us into when he invites us into this sermon is saying he's inviting us into this is what I'm like from the inside out. I'm not having you just look from the outside in. I'm bringing you in. I'm bringing you in that you can, you who were created in my image, you who were made according to my likeness, that you would have access to the interior life of God. The one you were created after. So this is what I'm like on the inside. All that's described in the sermon, it's not some type of law that we're looking into. It's some. It's a, it's a conforming into the image. Yeah. And that he, and so I always like to, um, to just give you that lens when you're looking into the sermon. That it's a lens into likeness. That God is inviting you into his interior life. And this is how his interior life blooms inside of us. So this idea that blessed are the meek, what's so special about this one is it is the only one that Jesus actually says when he's describing himself, he uses this language. He says, um, you know, it's, it's out of Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls now Jesus exemplifies all of the Beatitudes blessed are those who are poor in spirit blessed are those who mourn blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness he, he exemplifies all of them but this one this particular one he described himself when describing who he is and he didn't do it very often. But when he did, he said, learn of me. I am meek. And I feel like this is something, if we're going to get to the gold of who Jesus is, this is one of the golds. I mean, I just loved how we ended tonight just singing beauty, beauty, beautiful. By the way, that's David Brimer's original. And his CD is coming out in, a, in like less than a month. <laughs> Um, but then we got into that glory to the Lamb, right? And oh, the blood of the Lamb. Oh, the name of the Lamb, right? But this one that we love so much, when he came to the earth, he didn't come as a man. You know, I always think about that. I always think, wow, it would have been more impressive, I think, if he would, like, open the heavens and whoosh, you know, here comes the man, you know, and he's coming straight from heaven. I think it would have given him a lot more credibility, you know what I mean? And I, he, people would have just known, whoa, that's, he's from heaven, you know, and yet, no, that's not the way he goes. That's not the way he comes. He comes even more humble, more meek than Adam. Adam, when he was formed, was a fully grown man. When our God comes to the earth, he chooses to come as a babe. As a little baby, it's too much for us to even comprehend that he would come as a baby that has to trust parents for survival. Again, he had the option because if he's the second Adam, he could have just come 
whoosh, you know? But he doesn't. And then as he describes himself and as he's, as he's announced to the people, he's announced as the lamb. And that to me, again, in the midst of a culture that could be considered wolves, I think I would want to be introduced as a lion. You know what I mean? I wouldn't want to be introduced as a lamb. It's really awkward because like lots of, lots of predators, right? And yet here he comes. He's okay with the journey ahead of him, which requires meekness because it is who he is. It's the very essence of who our God is. He is meek. And that is what's so beautiful. Ah, so what is meekness? I mean, I'm sure we've all heard sermons on what is meekness, and you probably know better definitions than I do. But, like, when I think of meekness, how do I differentiate it from being poor in spirit? Because if poor in spirit is dependency on God, is total, you know, again, a, a, a posture of humility, then how is it different from meekness? The way I would differ it, because in, in the Greek, um, it's, it is a different word. But in the Hebrew, it's not. In the Hebrew, both poor and meek are, are, some, are the same words. And so how I would differentiate it is meekness is how we treat others. And poor in spirit is our posture before God. So being poor in spirit is how we are totally dependent upon God. And the meekness, it plays out in our relationships with people. And that's and we still can demonstrate our love for God in it. When we choose meekness with people, we are demonstrating that we follow the Lamb. We are demonstrating that we love the leadership of the Lamb. So um, that's helpful for me just in trying to di differentiate it. But I think a great verse to flip to is Philippians 2. Right? <laughs> You're like, yes, of course. <laughs> that's, I mean, a lot, I mean, that's a famous meekness verse. But I'm going to, I'm going to come at it at a different angle. <laughs> so, um, we're going to start with just verse one and read it till verse four. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, I'm so touched by that, even right now. Ah, he offers so much. Oh my goodness. Consolation, comfort of love, fellowship, that we're never alone, affection, guaranteed mercy, that we would always be looked through with tender mercy. He would always look upon us with a lens of tender mercy. He said, then fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now the paragraph begins with all this amazingness of us being recipients of and a lot of times when we look into meekness, we think, oh, we have to try hard. We have to constrain ourselves. But what God is saying, no, you have to be good receivers. Right here, he's saying, if, you know what? I'm not requiring this of if everyone. I'm requiring this if you have been one who's received my consolation. If you experience my new mercies, they're new every morning. If you come into my affections, if you experience me in these ways, the comfort of my love, then I ask you to be like me. So really, we're just reflecting the way we've been treated. That's really what happens. And the best way to cause someone to become more and more like you is for them to be a recipient of this. So we are a recipient of his meekness. How? When we receive the consolation that is in him. When he consoles us, right? And so if we're having a difficult time being meek, I think we're having a difficult time receiving the comfort of his love. I'm not saying it's the, but I would say it's a good one. Because <laughs> When I want, because a lot of times meekness is very um, ethereal, kind of. It's like, what is it exactly? But this makes it practical. 
how can I become more weak? Try harder? That is never the answer for Jesus. It's never the answer. The answer is become a better recipient of my consolation. Become a better recipient of the comfort of my love. Become a better recipient of my affections, of my mercy. He lists such wonderful things that he wants to give to us. And I love he even includes mercy, which we know those mercies are new every morning. And they go on and on forever. You can't just point to one time of your life and say, oh, there, that's when I experienced the mercy of God. No, that's for you forever. Mercy, the tender mercy of God is for us forever. And in it, as we experience it, meekness will come pouring out of our lives. Now, again, I, I shouldn't say it like that, maybe. It doesn't pour out always. But I think we have a more tendency towards it. And I love that this is an easy um, just indicator. Oh my goodness, meekness is not just a quick solution here. Why? And then point back to this. The other thing is um, doing things in, okay, because so, it says these are the two things we need to let go of, selfish ambition and being conceit. Now we can try to cast pride out of us as much as we want, but again, this is a way to let pride leave our lives, is to experience his consolation. I love that. This is a road into meekness. I want to just turn somewhere real quick. James. James. Um, two places in James. Let's just go to James 3. Actually, I want to go to James um, 1, verse 21. And it says, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, it's really interesting that something's implanted in you and you have to receive from it. Meaning, he's already planted his consolation in you. He's already planted his mercies in you. The fullness of God, it pleased God for the fullness of him, fullness of God to dwell in Jesus bodily. So I know this is going to take you somewhere where you're going to be like, what? But the fullness of God is in us. We don't experience the fullness of God because we experience God through our soul. But he has given us all of himself in us. The implanted word. He is in us and he has given us completely. He he gave, he said, and we are complete in him. And this is the substance of Christ. I mean, there's so much I could point to to try to prove this, but I'm just going to believe that you believe this. So the fullness of God is in us. And so this implanted word we're going to receive from. And that's what we do. And as we do that, because it says receive with meekness, what he's saying is it requires meekness to receive from that which is in you. So we're becoming meek when we receive from God. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's a very, the, the, the very, the very act of receiving from God is building meekness in you. Hopefully you get it. Okay. I mean, I'm excited about it. Okay. (laughs) Because, I mean, sometimes people are like, all I'm left with is try harder. And like, you know, you hear a sermon, be me, and you just are left with, okay, I'll try. You know? But I feel like, no, there's, there's actually this way that Jesus has given us so that we can cultivate meekness in our lives. And it doesn't mean we just have to have trouble all around us to practice it. It means that we can do this in the secret place. We actually can practice meekness with God. Amen. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so what what does meekness look when we're trying when we're using if we're doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, what does this look like? Well, when we're given position, when we're given resources that we're not doing every we're not manipulating controlling situations to try to um, cause us to move forward. But we're actually using our resources, using 
the favor that God has given us, whatever, and we're helping to steward other people into what they're called to. Or, or we're, help, we're using these things to build up others. That's part of meekness. Meekness is saying, I'm not going to just use the favor God's given me to try to improve my life. I am going to use the favor that God has given me to help others and to help steward others. So that is an aspect of it. Um, I always, and they, because we choose to go low, because it says with all lowliness of mind, meaning that if this is, when we're put in a situation, it's not always about us getting forward. It's about going low and letting the Lord bring forth what he wants to bring forth. Amen. So I, um, I always do this, but I'm going to try to, uh, what time is it? Because I'm going to try to end like, okay, amen. So I'm going to do it in 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so meekness of heart, meekness of the will, and meekness of the mind. So I'm going to go into, there's three ways that we can move into meekness. But, but before I do that, I want to say meekness is not a personality. Because and it's not passivity. That is not meekness. Meekness is strength. That is restrained. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's not passivity and it's not personality. It is it Christian meekness rests not upon constraint and resignation, but upon the freedom of the person who knows he is always and everywhere loved by God. Meekness rests not upon constraint and resignation, but upon the freedom of the person who knows he is always and everywhere loved by God. That is why God is so on this subject, because he knows if he can create confidence in his people that they are always and everywhere loved always and everywhere loved. They don't have to prove it by doing special favors for people. They don't have to prove it by people pleasing that they experience being everywhere and always loved by God. Then they can walk in meekness because their identity is not resting in the approval of others. Their identity is, is resting on God's eternal love that they experience on a daily basis. Amen. <laughs> and that's why, again, Philippians 2.1. Please do not quote Philippians 2.2 without Philippians 2.1. And by the way, if you go down further, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Guess what? That is